So this evening, I'm going to discuss some of the trends that appear in good pictures, but I'll be focusing on stylistic trends that return to the mistakes or cast off technologies of previous generations. And those mistakes uh, or old technologies were used to create new visual effects, as you might have heard us discussing earlier. So these aesthetic concerns also seem close to the work of many of the artists who are involved with Penumbra, and many of whom I've also written about elsewhere. Artists such as Rachel Boussier, Megan Rippenhoff, Teresa Gans, and Chris, currently Christine Elfman all immediately come to mind for their creative use of historic image making processes, whether it's lumen printing, cyanotype, hand painting, or anthotypes. They each use these historic image making practices to new and surprising ends um, in their work. And they're very much a part of the lineage that I'll describe this evening. And I'm grateful to all of them for inspiring me to think about the creative potential of what we now sometimes call alternative processes, but some of which were very much popular processes in their time. So I'll begin with a little history, which is no doubt familiar to most of you. Change in photographic style is often attributed to technological developments. Most major textbooks teach the history of photography as a history of technologies, especially during the 19th century. Beaumont Newhall follows this pattern. Camera obscura, perspective drawing, camera lucida, and the physiognomy trace all lead up to photography. And then comes Wedgwood, Neps, Daguerreotype, and Talbot's photogenic drawings. And those are just the first two chapters. You're all probably cringing. So the conventional story that's told by Newhall and others shows photography progressing from these infuriatingly slow exposures of 30 minutes or more in the medium's earliest years. And then they, they quickly celebrate the improvements in lenses and chemistry that made it possible to record portraits in much shorter times. And you can see that in this Alexander Gardner picture from 1862, there's the motion of the seated man and dog during the time of the exposure, and that leaves a streaky blur across the plate. So this was, of course, common in photography's early years, and it was especially visible in portraits that required their subjects to sit still. Most histories then go on to celebrate the invention of dry plate technology, which eventually allowed even amateurs to record fast motion, such as jumping and running. Edward Mybridge's improved mechanical shutters developed in the late 1870s seemed to be the apex of speed when they were invented. Newhall calls this chapter the conquest of action. Now, I don't mean to completely disparage this history. After all, it's true and it's necessary, but pictures and photographers don't always follow the rules, which is no doubt frustrating for an historian like Newhall who tried to button it all up. Instead, what became obvious to me in my research was that all along this timeline, there were moments of resistance and backlash against those technological advancements. In the second half of the 19th century, when photographers finally succeeded in recording the motion of steam trains, criticism quickly emerged, stating that these pictures looked too still. They made the impression that the trains weren't moving at all. So the success of the photographic process rendered the accomplishment of the photographer moot. This Belgian photographer even includes the fact that this is a so-called instantaneous picture in the title, perhaps to counteract the fact that the train looks so still. Although in this case, I suspect it probably was still, there are people standing on the tracks. Eventually, how-to guides and articles recommended including steam trailing behind the train to suggest motion. And here again, the title hints at motion, as does the steam and the perspective from aboard the train. And of course, as processes became even more rapid, views of motion and speed were actually possible, as in this one by William Henry Jackson. But in the early 20th century, you still feel the outer limit of the speed of the camera, especially as vehicles got faster. So it's challenging to arrest the motion of a speeding race car, even one like this that must be going rather slowly up the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb. And then the story goes, we have the real conquest of action in the 1930s with Harold Edgerton's high-speed electronic flash or strobe. These were rated at one 100 100,000th of a second. These high-speed pictures using Edgerton's methods were widely seen in the late 1930s, such as these that appeared in Life magazine. 
And the technology was further developed for use in World War II. And then electronic strobes, which are capable of syncing to the camera's shutter, became available on the consumer market after the war. By 1950, these semi-portable electronic flash units had become available widely. The size of their equipment diminished throughout the decade, although they still required a pretty heavy battery unit. And Edgerton even wrote his own how-to book that described the science and practice for creating high-speed stop-action photographs. But as soon as this ability to arrest rapid motion hit the market in the 1950s, I noticed a backlash in popular media and in the periodicals dedicated to photography. And I describe this as motion blur. It's the result of panning the camera to follow a moving subject. And the term is borrowed from filmmaking. The photographer chooses a slow shutter speed, which allows the background to blur while the moving subject remains sharply focused. As in this article in American Photography, from 1950, the author states, few pictures can be technically so good and pictorially so unsatisfactory as those in which motion is completely frozen. And it promises that panning is a technique for better pictures. The panning trend surged in popularity in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, especially in automotive and sports photography. You can see here that there's even a fake blur added to the Dunlap logo in the background. And here too, at the right, an illustrator has added blur to a drawing. And at left, the photographer shows a distinction between this old style pervasive blur on the top, which is both motion blur and camera shake, and the more controlled blur achieved through panning. The use of motion blur was justified in the how-to literature as everything from a more natural way of perceiving motion to a fitting aesthetic for the cultural upheavals of the 60s. At the time, no one described motion blur as a response to those overly sharp still photographs. But looking back at that history, the reversal or backlash to new technology is really easy to see. And I discovered similar reversals time and time again in my research. When phot photographic technology overcame a particular limit or a perceived failure, then the former accidental effects are reintroduced for aesthetic gain but only after it has become obvious that those one-time mistakes are now used for artistic intent. Like most trends, the overwhelming popularity of motion blur also led to a critical rejection in the 60s. Magazines debated the battle over blur. They asked whether photographers were going blur crazy or whether it was a creative tool or just sloppy technique. And there's enormous anxiety in photography over technique and the limits of artistic freedom. Most articles concluded like this one that quote, it's all too easy to blur a picture through sheer incompetence, end quote. Only photography, only after photography proves its competence through technological innovation, can these mistakes be welcomed back into the practice for artistic effects. Again, this pattern of technological advancement followed by a deliberate reintroduction of former accidents is something I observed throughout the history. And a number of these trends appeared in the mid 20th century, like motion blur, but also the intentional use of film grain and lens flare. But the pattern is not limited to the 20th century. Earlier trends such as soft focus and vignetting in the 19th century also represent a return to former failures. And I'm going to turn to them now. In 1867, the Philadelphia Photographer magazine uh, bemoaned the shallow depth of field possessed by most portrait lenses. The author blamed the use of stock poses to this technical limitation. Photographers were forced to arrange their subjects in a narrow plane to keep all of their features in sharp focus at once. And the frustration increased with the introduction of multiple sitters. The author here says, how disagreeable the effect of the blurred outline of the further shoulder. And he suggests using India ink to give definition to cloud-like masses of hair and the projecting end of the nose. 50 years later though, the soft, fo soft focus was a highly sought after effect. In a manual for pictorial photographers, Paul Anderson enthused about the Struess pictorial lens, especially designed for pictorial work quote, such a lens possessing all possible errors and giving as a result of its optical defects a very soft and pleasing quality of definition. So the, or the ability to reevaluate these former faults or errors as uniquely photographic effects is one of the most enduring artistic moves in the medium. 
Soft focus techniques were especially popular during turn of the century art photographers who aimed to produce a sense of atmosphere and mood and emotion in their prints. They tried to distinguish art or pictorial photography from the work of Kodak snap shooters. Here, the young Alfred Stieglitz um, is being one of the most vocal advocates for this new group. As he wrote, the Kodak has placed in the hands of the general public a means of making pictures with but little labor and requiring less knowledge has of necessity been followed by the production of millions of photographs. It is due to this fatal facility that photography as a picture making medium has fallen into disrepute in so many quarters. Stieglitz and others in his circle even aimed to elevate uh, photography's reputation for artistry. These self-proclaimed art photographers sought to transform the medium from a purely mechanical pursuit into one that favored ideas and emotion over the direct transcription of visual facts. In exhibitions and in the journals published by two prominent New York-based amateur camera clubs, Stieglitz set forth the ideals of his new art photography. The aims were richly illustrated with photographs by Stieglitz and his contemporaries, as well as the work of early 19th century pictorial photographers like Julia Margaret Cameron and David Octavius Hill. 40 of Hill's photographs from the 1840s were included in an exhibition organized by Stieglitz in 1910. And the catalog introduced Hill like this, quote, at the very threshold of the new art of photography, there was a worker who realized its possibilities, restricted though they were technically, for pictorial and individual expression, end quote. In the new pictorialist estimation, these technical limitations were also vital sources of aesthetic feeling. The soft focus effect is the one that is most indelibly linked with pictorialism. The effect could be created in camera by the lens or later in the printing process. At the turn of the century, photographers had to deconstruct or misuse lenses to achieve this desired out of focus effect. Some relied on lenses that produced chromatic or spherical aberrations, which were optical effects that were originally the bane of the photographic industry. By the 1910s, companies were manufacturing lenses that allowed photographers to introduce varying degrees of softness into their negatives intentionally. With the growing accessibility of the soft focus style though, some editors issued warnings about its overuse. An article in Wilson's photographic magazine rebuked readers, quote, the lens does not supply brains. It must not be imagined that the mere fact of using a soft focus lens will of necessity make the pictures artistic. Softness of definition per se is not art. And if the photographer is not an artist and has no ideas, no individuality to put into his pictures, then the lens will not supply them, end quote. Even Stieglitz's strident philosophy was changing in the late teens. He published Paul Strand's manifesto on objective photography in camera work in 1917. By 1920, the photographic journal was also cautioning photographers against the overuse of soft focus. They wrote, discard the idea that all it is necessary to do in order to become a photographic artist is to get a soft focus lens and take pictures as blurry and indistinct as possible. Mush is not impressionism. Mystery is not obscurity and disintegration. Suggestion suggests something. By this point in the 1920s, the origin of soft focus in accident was almost entirely forgotten and its intentional use as the pictorial take was, or technique was the only lasting aspect. But like most trends, soft focus didn't disappear forever. It remained available for reevaluation and reuse. And techniques like photographing through glass and Vaseline or even nylon stockings, as you see in the picture at the right, were published widely in amateur manuals during the, 19th, or during the mid 20th century. Those turn of the century art photographers were also embracing other limitations imposed by early photographic printing processes. Again, as opposed to the ease of sending a Kodak back to Rochester for processing and printing, the pictorialists returned to unique handmade processes that were pioneered 50 years earlier. They accomplished these artistic goals by rejecting the fatal facility of modern photography and returning to these vintage printing processes like gum bichromate. The gum print process was called for mixing pigment with a layer of gum arabic made sensitive to light in combination with potassium bicarbonate. 
When exposed to light beneath the negative, areas of the image that received more light were hardened. And then the print was finished by brushing on warm water, which enabled the photographer to selectively dissolve some areas of the hardened gum, which resulted in a print that looked like a watercolor or wash drawing, like this one by uh, Casabir. In instructional articles and reviews, authors frequently rehearsed the history of gum bichromate. Most of them took care to describe it as a long outmoded process introduced in the 1850s. So these 20th century photographers were positioning themselves intentionally as neo-Luddites within this otherwise highly technologized and increasingly professionalized discourse of photography. The gum print was celebrated for its soft painterly effects and the ability it afforded to restrict detail through local development. Printing on rough paper also gave the appearance of a charcoal or a crayon sketch. Gum and other painterly effects also became ubiquitous at the pictorialist exhibitions. But critics warned that gum wasn't suitable, suitable for every type of picture, and they suggested other older printing techniques, especially platinum, which had been revered for its softness and wide mid-tone range. Even as the popularity of the gum print declined in the 1920s, the distinction that it helped to illustrate between objective anonymous photography and the individual artistic print would long remain. Reevaluation of these former technical failures didn't start with Stieglitz and the pictorialists though. Photographers were already experimenting with great mistakes in the mid 19th century, just a decade after Daguerre's first public announcement of the medium. In 1849, the Boston-based photographer John Adams Whipple patented a method for making photographs that had the appearance of, quote, portraits taken in crayon. To create this crayon effect, Whipple framed his sitter behind an oval or circular cutout from a large screen, and during the exposure, he slightly but continuously moved the screen to create a softly blurred effect around the subject, extending to the edges of the picture. While the white at the top edge blended into Whipple's light colored backgrounds, detail fell away at the bottom of the image, like those partially rendered um, head and shoulders portrait sketches popular at the time. Those portraits were also later known as vignettes, which is a term borrowed from the 18th century use uh, for decorative embellishments surrounding the edges of prints and manuscripts. The photographer Marcus Aurelius Root's appreciation of the crayon process underscores this traditional use. He defined the style in his influential 1864 textbook. He called it a vignette portrait, the head and shoulders in the crayon style, which he generally found more pleasing to the true artist and connoisseur than even the full length or half figure. As in portrait painting and sketches, the unfinished effect was reserved for marble port or for bust portraits which themselves referenced the tradition of classical sculptural busts in marble or bronze. So crayons and vignettes proved to be remarkably lasting in photography. They were popular throughout the 19th century, despite the many changes in the medium from the period of daguerreotypes to albumen. Several adaptations to the process were deployed, including one by the society photographer Oliver Cerrone in 1869. Cerrone made photo crayons, uh, which was the description that he applied to photographing a vignette picture through on tissue paper, and then laying it on a sheet of chemi chemically tinted drawing paper, which had been pre-prepared with pencil hash marks to make them look even more like drawings. So Whipple's original patent recommended the use of light backgrounds, but dark crayons were also produced, which show the subject engulfed in shadow. And this effect would have been familiar to 19th century photographers as the result of using a lens too small to adequately cover the plate. And this leaves unexposed corners at the edges that appear black in the positive image. In other words, this was a very early mistake, which was turned around to aesthetic effect. Like many trends, this visible shortcoming returned and it was intentionally used for artistic ends. Today, the term vignetting, um, even on your iPhone, refers primarily to those darkened corners in photographs, concentrating on the medium specific failure rather than on its aesthetic adaptation by Whipple or Cerrone in their light colored crayon portraits. With the invention of the dry plate process in the 1880s, the most intrepid photographers set off to explore a subject that had been off limits to photography until then, 
This was the night. The early years of night photography focused on using artificial illumination, such as magnesium flash powder, to bring light into dark places. By the turn of the century, though, artistic photography could be accomplished at night without the aid of the blinding explosive flash. And photographers in the United States took to the street in the late 1890s, inspired by a series of nocturnal views of London by the British photographer Paul Martin. At the end of 1897, Stieglitz described night photography as, quote, the novelty of the year. Most instructional articles recommended working in cities with street lamps, um, which reveals their modern fascination with electric light and a newfound appreciation of the urban environment. But it was also a necessity to have some bright light in the scene. Martin's exposures required 30 minutes or more. An American photographer at this time recommended measuring these long exposures by counting the number of times one has to refill one's pipe. Working on a well-lit street, Stieglitz was able to reduce his own exposures to just one minute. And one imagines you wouldn't even get to finish your pipe during that time. These inclement weather conditions were also prized as reflections in the wet streets or brilliant white snow shortened the exposure times and increased visible detail in otherwise dark areas of the composition. The rainy night trend was well established by 1910 when the critic Sadakichi Hartman wrote in a pamphlet dedicated to night photography, quote, we are the slaves of tradition. And so for most of us, photographing at night seems to call for rain and snow with their attendant discomforts. The procedure for making night photographs was also highly regularized. Many commentators recommended that the photographer block direct lights from entering the lens in order to limit halation, which is a localized overexposure surrounding the light source. Um, and this happens when light passes through the plate and is reflected back into the image layer. Trees and telephone poles served as ready-made lens shades and anti-halation halation plates made with a backing to prevent reflection were eventually developed in the early 20th century. How-to manuals struggled mightily with balancing the technical and aesthetic demands of night photography. The photographer Charles Piazzi Smith noted, quote, a little halation around the bright lights, if not too sharply defined, is not altogether objectionable as a little haze gives a truer appearance of what is really seen with the eye. Hartman agreed. Halations and light seen in drizzling rain or spreading on the mist really add to the pictorial effect. Those who are enamored with the artificial light of the night want it as it is with all its breaks, supernatural radiance, hectic glow and gleam amidst opaque recesses and intensest darks. But the aesthetic battle also hints at an ideological one. Why take pictures at all? Was photography a technical achievement or an artistic practice? Criticism of night photography clearly revealed this ongoing debate. One critic enumerated the differences between pictures made for aesthetic appreciation versus those made to display technical virtuosity. Quote, the photographer who is interested mainly in the science and the technical difficulties of his medium will show this in his choice of subjects. He will not seek to evade difficulties. He will not endeavor to cover up the lights in his picture with a convenient tree or a telegraph post, but will glory in rendering as many lamps as possible with the minimum of halation and other technical faults. The artist, on the other hand, will include as few lamps as possible in his picture. A little halation too will not be regarded as a grievous fault for on a misty night, such an effect is seen in nature. Each lamp has a little halo around it. Another critic engaged in the debate this way. H. Powell Higgins wrote in 1910, let us be artists of the night by all means, but why expose plates at night for merely scientific enjoyment? The apparent conflict between art and science is often described, especially in photography. But here I'm interested in how those two terms came to represent accuracy or perfect exposures and accidents or technical mistakes. In my research, I found that these two terms were interchangeable. When it became technically possible to avoid technical faults, they were suddenly identified with artful photography. And the too perfect picture was then criticized as the scientific one. Prior to achieving technical capabilities such as anti-halation plates, when the photographer's 
tension could not be achieved, these shortcomings were regarded as mistakes. Only after they could be overcome were these mistakes reintroduced and regarded as good pictures or great mistakes. Thanks. So I'm gonna turn this back to a conversation with Adam. And I will encourage you all to start loading your questions um, into the Q&A box. It was fun to see this this version of it, Kim. I I did start uh, this process. So you and I have known each other for for quite a while. But I when I, I remember when you asked me to read your manuscript and you told me how many chapters was in it. I what was the total? Fifty. Fifty. Right. <laughs> so. I, I have to admit, it did seem like a monumental task, but I, knowing I've always enjoyed our conversations, that there there must be something interesting in it. But I have to admit, it was it was fifty sh very short, fifty chapters. But I, it was actually a page turner, and and I f found myself just like really interested and enraptured in all of these different trends. And you know, I've come to the history of photography and the technical side of it as a photographer and as a maker. And I feel like I'm probably in the above average category of my investment in process and enjoyment of geeking out about process and stuff. But, but yeah, I, I didn't, I never came at it from like the popular culture sort of way or like what are trends and what are looks. And this was really the first time that I think I've ever seen that combined. And um, yeah, it was really fun to read and my gears are always turning. But so I have one, so I had, I have a larger question that I want to ask just about sort of generally how you come to this and you know why I'm curious about that. But when you were giving your presentation, something else came up that I was like, oh, I have to ask that first or we're not going to get to it. So I'm curious of everything that you've researched and say put in the book, whether it's a trend or a technique or something technical, do you have any like just favorites, things that you really love or you find like, you know, you just like they pull at your heart in the right way. And, and then I guess the flip would be, do you have any that you despise? And you're like, oh my God, thank God they moved away from this. <laughs> I have to admit, I really love motion blur. And I love that question. Um, the motion blur was the thing that got me into this research to start with, um, because it seems so popular. You see it in lots of different places, even when I started looking into it in the early 2000s. Um, but I know it was also something you're not supposed to do unless you know how to do it correctly. Um, so I was curious about when that shift happened. And I just, um, I honestly just flipped through magazines to see when it happened because these blurred pictures that you see in the early 2000s are mostly like motorsports, but they're also used in video games. Um, so I was wondering like, this is a popular trend um, and when did it happen? So I went to the library um, and looked through Motor Trend magazine, <laughs> as many issues as I could find as early as I could find. And sure enough, there was, a a, like really marked um, emergence of the trend in the 1950s. Hmm. So that's my favorite aesthetically. That sounds pretty good. Oh, and like, do I now I need the flip, right. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know, it's so hard to say. My favorite are the ones that were surprising to me. Um, and it's, I can't, I can't dislike any of them. I mean, honestly, I, there are 50 chapters, but I did have to make some cuts. So the ones mm. that were outside my cut are the ones that I wasn't that interested in. Right. I, I see. I, yeah. I guess from your perspective, all of, all of the, the, maybe the quirkier or even uglier or, you know, aesthetically weird um, would be of even more interest. I, I guess, yeah. Well, so my general question and, and something that I realized, like I, we've gotten to know each other pretty well and we've, we, I find we have a lot of conversations about, you know, I'm bringing you a stack of pictures or new things. And it's funny, I, I oftentimes forget that I'm, I'm not talking to a photographer 
I think, which I find, you know, I have a lot of friends and colleagues that are art historians and photo historians and, and we go out photographing together and, and they approach it in a way that feels distinctly different from at least my perspective as a maker. And you might be one of the first that felt like, man, I've never met, I, I can't believe we're thinking so similarly about photographs and the history and the contemporary making of it. And I know how I've come to the technical side of things in photography, which is 100% as a maker of pictures. And if I'm gonna research something like, you know, the night photography history and technique and everything, I'm gonna be coming to that because I'm having a hard time making those pictures or I wanna figure out how to pay homage to this old method or something like that. So I'm, I'm curious about how do you come to this? Like how, I guess, generally do you come to the topic of this book and sort of a macro, but yeah, what, what leads you in and out of the different specific sections and interests? Because clearly you're very passionate about it. And yeah, I'm wondering what sort of fuels that fire for you. Um, well, it's interesting. I, it's, I like the, your description of going to the historical um, in order to find something useful today. And I think maybe on some level, I do that too, even if it's only to understand contemporary trends. I think I started thinking about this book um, around 2010. Um, and I was teaching at UC Santa Cruz and I encountered a couple students who persistently would look at a, a Stephen Shore photograph or William Eggleston photograph and think it came off Instagram. And at first I was like, really, I was upset. Like, how can you take this look of the 1970s, this particular film, this particular moment, and just recreate it in the 2010s. Like it doesn't mean anything. And then as I started thinking more about it, I was like, this is not limited to our time. This borrowing of earlier aesthetics is something that's in endemic to the process of photography. And this is, and maybe all art, you know, it's even though it's often taught in a forward march um, from pyramids to Picasso, it doesn't always go forward. It's almost always two steps forward, one step back. Um, and so it's always kind of braided that way. And then maybe the second half of your question, um, it's time for the big reveal. I did study photography a little bit. Um, so as an undergrad, I did not study art history. I was a complete undergrad at Brown and I was lucky enough to get to take uh, photo classes at RISD. Um, and so I was so appreciative of the uh, introduction to not only making things in the dark room, but also learning about pictures from people like Stephen Smith um, so I had that excellent experience, but I also didn't have the experience of art history. So when I went to grad school, I didn't have any of those like received ideas about the history of the medium. Um, and so, you know, like you turning to night photography to kind of figure something out, I also am looking back and trying to make my own history. Um, mm -hmm. And I also see where the history doesn't seem quite right to me. Like it doesn't seem right when Newhall says that it, it goes, it's always a technological advancement. It doesn't work like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, which is which is very appropriate for the venue that this conversation is in. Of a lot of people that like to go back and explore, you know, processes that are are definitely called alternative. But I, I think something a point that you made that I think about a lot is not all, but most of the processes that you're discussing and and all the things that everyone here is making they weren't always alternative. At mm -hmm. one point, they were the equivalent to, you know, the iPhone and, well, Instagram, I guess. But we could even say a digital camera and an inkjet printer uh, as far as like today's contemporary medium. But it's just an interesting thought process of like, how was this process when it was contemporary? Because now we think of it so differently. And it even feels to me like film now is, if you're shooting film, that's an alternative process and in some ways, yeah, which is crazy. Um, right. But yeah, I, you know, the, in thinking about that, like about that transition from, you know, as a photographer myself, from film to digital, I was using, since undergrad only, a, I jumped on, I went to MassArt and was surrounded by professors that loved big cameras. And so 
quickly I was using a four by five and just about my whole life as a photographer. And I was using view cameras and working in that, in, in, a, in a way that a view camera somewhat dictates by the nature of the, the beast. And I know when I, I started shooting digital in 2015, I, you know, I, which was really the first time that I'd done that, I, it was a radically different process and different way of, you know, the, the tools and the techniques and stuff, I could figure out the technical part of it, but I, I was amazed at how much it changed the pictures I was making. And it my even then my brain started compensating and saying, oh, now you can make these pictures, you know, conceptually, like now you can do this and this and this. And, and I'm making pictures now that I, I don't think I would have ever arrived at shooting an eight by 10. And I look forward to making the pictures I did make with an eight by 10. But I, I find that when we go, when we go to like contemporary artist talks, that talk of technique is pretty absent. And, you know, you even said in, in the book of change in photographic style is often attributed to technical development. And, you know, knowing what it's like to use different cameras, I, and I think everyone that's used a Leica handheld walking down the street versus an eight by 10 on the tripod, we know that that is very much dictating the subject or the way we work. And I guess I find that it's almost like bad words to talk about cameras. Like even, even not, not talking about like getting really nerdy about process, but like even talking about the tools that are being used in a photo lecture now, it, it, it's just, it's something that feels like it's, it's off limits. And, and I'm curious as a historian and a lover of contemporary photography and you're friends with many artists, I'm just curious, like, do you find that that strange? Do you find that that's something that's lacking from the contemporary dialogue? Is it, would, is it something that you think would be valuable for, for, to be more openly discussed to a certain degree? Yeah, no, it's really interesting because I remember very clearly working at a museum and getting, being fearful of the question that comes from the audience and that, you know, there's always going to be one that's like, so have you made the transition to digital yet? And, or, um, so what kind of camera do you use? And I don't think that those were as detailed as what you're describing, because mm -hmm. clearly using a view camera means that your pictures are gonna take longer to make and you have to set up and you're in, everything is different. Mm -hmm. But I think the wariness that I felt and maybe others felt at those questions was that it was just a technology question, not a question about how the technology shapes the kind of image you make. And I think probably um, both sides um, should pay more attention to that, to think about how these two things are woven together. Um, and that if it's going to be a question about you've made a transition to digital, what has that allowed in your work? Um, because, and, and that's fascinating to think that your brain has recalibrated to see scenes differently. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, just as all of our brains recalibrate to see a screen differently when you know the iPhone comes out with a more high resolution screen. We become adapted to the thing that we see or we work with all the time. So I think there is, you're right, there's a resistance to talking about process probably on the part of artists and curators who worry that it won't address the content of the images. Um, but I don't, I think, you know, my book is sort of an attempt to prove that those things are inextricable, that right. the way something looks has everything to do with how it was made and the way it looks affects how it means or what it means. Mm. So I'd love to see a return to some of those questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder, do you think, um, I guess I'm curious what you would in talking about technique, and, and I think a lot of the the artists that you mentioned that you've worked with that have also done residencies here, um, they're using alternative processes and they are going backwards. And, and you know, we can look at um, like Megan Rippenhoff's work and we can say, oh, she's working with cyanotype. And we can look at that. And it, it's hard for us to just look at them as sort of abstract paintings of waves and water. We, we think about the history of photography. We think about the, the cyanotypes that were made when they were, why they were. And, and I, I think there's instantly a sense of 
uh, historical reflectance when looking at you know very contemporary work. And I guess I'm I'm I am even though I love that type of work and I've taught alternative process classes and I've always found that I've resorted to using the contemporary norm you know of the time to to a certain degree. I guess in 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 a way of trying for the the dialogue around the work to not be about technique. Like I, I actually want that as much as I love the nerdy stuff, I also want it to be invisible. I want the work to be the work and I I don't I I, I don't need to see my hand in the making, I guess. Yeah. But I'm curious so I'm curious like now how do you think we would look back on now? Like how in the way that we can see Megan's work and we can go back to cyanotypes and the history and that. I'd be curious like what you think if you were writing your book 50 years from now, what are you, what are you seeing now? And like, what are the, the trends and um, yeah. What are, what are the stylistic things and technologies that you feel like are shaping photography and art now? Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, just 50 years from now, going to be so different and I'm really not good at uh, guessing what technologies will come next um, I'm not even good at guessing that like a pandemic is going to become a pandemic I never thought this would last so don't come to me for your future predictions but um, uh, I think a future historian above all would feel like there are so many different things. I mean, this is kind of what Newhall did is that he condensed it down and said, this is what pictures looked like at this time. And I don't think just like now, there's no single way that pictures have looked. There's always gonna be sometimes outliers and sometimes major groups that are in total conflict with each other. Um, if you think about like how uneasily the surrealists uh, sit in the history of art, like there's, they're not part of this, you know, march towards um, realism um, or, and then away from realism. Um, so there's this, there's a difficulty of saying like, this is everything that we would look at because I'll, I can immediately think of um, studio produced work, um, a lot of, um, interesting work that's like blurring the boundaries between sculpture and photography, but there's also a movement towards environmental portraits um, and photo books, um, especially, you know, kind of uh, portrait based photo books, explorations of communities. So it's hard to say that any of those things like are of this moment. Um, and, and I, I I don't know. I'm glad I wrote the book now and I don't have to write it again in 50 years. <laughs> well, we, well, you might need a second edition. 